This is not an ugly case like we so often talk about on this show. This is one of the, those where things went smoothly, harmoniously. Yeah. Isn't it refreshing to have a family where it doesn't appear to be? I know. I know. That's why I picked this one because I was like, we have just put we need our a audience break. through the ringer. Yeah. <laughs> Life's Third Act is a podcast dedicated to helping you get the most out of your retirement. Sponsored by Tucker Allen, here's attorney CPA, Joe Cordell. Welcome to another episode of Life's Third Act. This week, we're going to talk about a name I think all of you will know, James Gandolfini, Jr. (laughs) It is Jr. Yes. Yeah. So, um... Many of you, of course, will know him from Sopranos, but you may not know a lot of other stuff about him. And many of you may not even know that he passed away mm-hmm. not that long ago. What year was it, actually? 2013. 13. Was it that long yeah. ago? Yeah. So 10 years, but it still doesn't seem that long ago. I know. So, so we want to talk about his estate planning, of course, and uh, just kind of critique that, try to show some some good and bad, in this case, uh, mostly good. Mm-hmm. Uh, depending on your perspective. <laughs> so let, let's go ahead and look at his life. Give give us, Marley, a sense of his early background. Because I actually, you know, there's a lot of actors that many of us know a little bit about their history, and, and they've had backstories, married mm-hmm. to prominent celebrities. We can all think of these examples in this world, in the YouTube world. But but as to Gandolfini, I, not a lot of his background comes to mind. So. Yeah. So he was born in 1961 um, in New Jersey, and he was born to Italian immigrants. Um, his father was a bricklayer, and his mother was um, a cafeteria lunch lady. So he didn't really come up with a whole lot. Um, you know, I think they really instilled a lot of hard work in him. But, um, yeah, he really ended up making a really big name for himself later on in his life. And I really think that is due to his parents. I think, didn't they speak Italian at home? Yes, they spoke yeah. full Italian at home. So he was very proud of his Italian mm-hmm. roots. Yeah, yeah. and I, I bet that would have been hard as a kid going to school and speaking English and then coming back and speaking yeah. Italian. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And growing up in New Jersey, probably had yeah. so strong Italian neighbors mm-hmm. or neighborhoods. Um, so now uh, he finishes high school in New Jersey. Yes. And he ends up going to college. Yes, he goes to Rutgers College, um, Rutgers University, and he graduates with a degree in communications. Which now, what year was that? That was 1983 that he okay. graduated with a degree in communications. All right. Communications. I wonder I know. what the plan was. I know. That's what I was also thinking about, too. I guess... I don't know. I feel like for some people, and I'm making fun of myself when I say this, but it's like a fallback degree almost. So your Mm -hmm. parents are like, you got to go to high school. You got to go to, or you got to go to college. You got to go to college. And you're just kind of like, I don't know what I want to do. So you end up going in communications, but. Yeah. Yeah. That raises a whole nother topic. (laughs) Oh, yes. (laughs) But yes, that is very common phenomenon. And uh, there, but, but with him, there was no evidence that he had an interest in acting. I, I, I mean, there was, at least from no, what I saw. Yeah, not a whole lot. So after he graduates college, um, he goes and he works in some nightclubs. He's a bouncer, um, a bartender. He even manages some. And he moves to New York City. Um, and then somewhere along the way, his friend is like, hey, come to this acting class with me. Um, and so I feel like he's just one of those people that likes to try new things. And he was kind of intrigued by it. Um, I'm sure if you're in New York and you live there, you're... You see all the actors, actresses, and you're interested. Um, So he went and he loved it. And from there, he started pursuing different kinds of acting uh, roles while he was working as a delivery man. Yeah. So so he was bitten by the bug. Yeah. Yeah. And see, I imagine where he grew up in New Jersey, not far from from New York Mm -hmm. City. He probably spent a lot of time in New York City. Yeah. Probably... Went to a lot of plays because he did. He did end up finding initially parts since he's New York and looking to act. Generally, that's going to be stage. Yes, and more often off Broadway, if mm-hmm. not off off Broadway. <laughs> but you know, it is a springboard into film someday as his career. Yeah, I mean, I definitely think a lot of actors, actresses started out on Broadway um, or off off Broadway. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think when you live that close to the city, too. 
some part of you for a lot of people who live in New York are like, I want to be a star. So I feel like that, like you said, he got the bug and he did that acting class and he's like, okay, well, this is it from here. I figured out what I want to do. Everything you build for you and your family deserves protecting. All of those important assets you have worked so hard to acquire and enjoy, you want to make sure they're handled with care. At Tucker Allen, our attorneys will customize an estate plan that will work for you and your family's goals and needs. Tucker Allen, estate planning, probate, and trust administration. Visit TuckerAllen.com. And I mean, he worked really hard for it. Um, in 1992, he was in A Streetcar Named Desire on Broadway. Um, but not the Stan Kalski role or not Not, the not anything role. big. No, um, I think he... I couldn't find the specific part, but I think he just played, like, either one of the extras or um, a background singer or something like that. Yeah, Stanley Kowalski, maybe that's the name of that that character. Yeah, 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 yeah. That uh, Marlon Marlon Brando made famous. Yes, I haven't seen that Broadway play in a long time. (laughs) So he was in that, and um, he continued to act some. Yeah, um, he continued to act, and then in, I believe it was um, 93, he got into the Get Shorty film. He got a role in that film. Um, I wonder how he, and and now True Romance was the same year? Yes, yeah. So I wonder how, and we don't, as we research the history for this show, there's just lots of things that, that, you know, we can't find the information for. We're curious if any of you want to you know, make comments and provide us some of this backstory. I'm wondering how he makes it from these small roles um, on stage in New York into these two significant films. Those of you who've not seen True Romance, um, it's it is a really uh, it's an amazing movie. It's an ama- it's not a forgettable movie. If you watch this movie, it's not easily forgettable. It has a happy ending, uh, though. You're going to at points. <laughs> be asking yourself how is this possible <laughs> but it's not a spoiler to say that, that it has a happy ending and um, that was written by Quentin Tarantino yeah. so he ends up with a part that I thought he really stood out in that movie yeah and I think that was a big part of it is he like you said stood out and I think he just networked a lot um, the Broadway musical that he was in um, Alec Baldwin was in it and Jessica Lange uh, was too so I yeah. think even if he was you know one of the extras or what have you um, he was talking to people no matter what that's a good point yeah so that I, would be a, that would make sense yeah I he, think he made a bunch of connections okay so um, um, I'm curious did he stay in LA or did he stay in New Jersey or New York City. He went back, didn't he? Uh, yeah. Except for he, filming. He went back. Yeah, that's correct. Um, so he, yeah, he lived in New York. So, um, yeah, I think he spent a majority of time there. Yeah, yeah. He owned a place mm-hmm. in Manhattan. Mm-hmm. Um, and also, uh, Get Shorty. I guess that was filmed in L.A. Yes, Whereas that was. True Romance, a lot of that. Well, p- part of that was filmed in in California, you can tell. Um, so he does very well in these two roles. Mm-hmm. But then, you know, there's kind of what seems like this dry spell or this valley between that point, which, again, two very good movies. Mm-hmm. I don't know what sort of critical notice true romance got i think it got get shorty got good reviews but uh, true romance certainly he did an impressive uh, performance in that but we don't see him prominently in anything until of course tony <laughs> soprano comes yes, around yeah at age 37 he did that so i mean his first two movies were at age 25 and then not until age 37 did he have a really really big role and i don't know if that's just because like He's heavily Italian, obviously. Mm-hmm. So I don't know if like a lot of roles just didn't fit him because that's like wasn't the person they were looking for or kind of what happened. But I mean, he's an amazing actor. Yeah. So that's why it's really odd to me. I don't know if something, you know, happened in his home life, family life, but Yeah, and it I don't know. It, it could be work ethic too, in terms yeah. of, you know, some people work harder to get into the movie industry than others. And, yeah. And you wonder how many incredible talents are there out there that we never see because 
they weren't the ones who were maybe hanging out as many hours a day as others were mm-hmm. in order to get their foot in the door. But um, he also was was very well liked. I noticed that, and we'll talk a little more about this when we come to the state planning in a second. Um, he, he had a lot of people on the set who liked him. Mm-hmm. He wasn't known as one of these temperamental, egotistical guys. Uh, even when he became a star, uh, you you can look at the comments that were made at the time of his death by those who worked with him. I invite you to read all those. You can find those at a number of places. Yes. And some, I think Wikipedia does a good job of talking a little bit about this. But also, there's uh, there's a site that his family has set up for him mm-hmm. too under his name. So um, he he had a lot of people that liked him. So that must have helped him. Yeah, I think like I mean thinking about that. He probably was just like a go with the flow guy. And if he got the role, he got the role. And if he didn't, he didn't. But it wasn't the end of the world or his acting career for him. I think he just liked being around those people because, like you said, he was really friendly to everybody. I don't think he had like a single enemy in the acting world. Everybody, you know, enjoyed his company, but he might just not have been a good fit for all of the roles. Yeah. I'm reminded of, uh, and he's an exception to the role that I'm reminded of. Paul McCartney said this once in an interview, which doesn't seem to describe Paul McCartney, but it was at a time in his life when when the Beatles were struggling to be successful. And uh, he was he was asked about their success mm-hmm. and relative to so many bands at the time and, and competing musicians, many of whom were uh, very talented, whether or not they were as talented. Uh, but his comment was, he says, you show me somebody in, in show business or music who's incredibly successful, and I'll show you a son of a bitch. <laughs> and, and he said, and he said of the Beatles, he said, we were the worst sons of bitches. Um, what he meant by that was that, um, that you know, unfortunately, a lot of people who are successful, you know, they're just very driven. They're prepared yes. to step on toes. And, and again, it's not, a, it's not a rule without exceptions, and Gandolfini's one of them. Uh, but we all know that it does appear to be a general rule. Uh, but but I'm always impressed with those who have as many people to say things about his personality and his character mm-hmm. off stage and on stage, meaning you know behind the camera whenever they're talking and preparing for roles and you know in the in a professional environment apart from private. But in a professional, it's where I think often that sort of personality shows through. Yes. You know, they're wanting, you know, star tier uh, treatment in so many intangible ways related to a production. Whereas with Gandolfini, you don't hear of any of that. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's just, you know, the major difference. He had, I don't want to say, you know, all actors and actresses who have big roles don't have morals and ethics. But I think... Mm. He was just raised very humbly, and I think he was raised to be very kind to people and not, you know, push everybody out of the way to get roles, to be mean to people to get roles or to, like, buy roles or anything like that. I think Mm -hmm. he thought that I have to work for this, and if I'm not getting these, then I need to work, you know, a little bit harder for it. Yeah. Yeah, there was a dispute on The Sopranos um, in which... uh, having to do with with uh, financials, the way in which they allocated the budget mm-hmm. and which meant the majority of which related to salaries. And Gandolfini was, of course, being paid very generously. And he disagreed with the manner in which, you know, it was allocated for others. So he took money and gave oh. to other people that were in the production that he felt should have more. And the number that comes to mind is like, to several people, I may be wrong about this, like 500,000 bucks? Yeah, it was quite a bit. I mean, he was the leading role, so obviously he was going to get paid more, but to have that kind of heart and to be that generous, to be like, no, these people need to be getting yeah. paid more as well. Yeah, and he was willing to put his money where his yeah. mouth was in terms of that. So so anyway, lots of good things can be said about him personally. Uh, let's talk about he ends up getting married. Mm-hmm. He has children yes so he ends up getting married in 99 um to oh my gosh um marcella or yes marcella um wardowski and they have a son michael in 99 as well he was born in may of 99 okay so this would have been right after he got the tony soprano role well excuse me right after hbo aired the sopranos um in january so i bet Everything, you know, was going well Everything for was him. Good. And, yeah. Um, but they end up getting divorced in 2002. 
And I couldn't find a lot on their divorce. Um, I think it was, it might have been messy at the start, but it was pretty amicable towards the end. Um, everything that I read said he was still like a really good dad. He was still involved in his son's life when he could be, because obviously he had a very busy schedule. But um, he gave her a lot of what she asked for. And in the divorce, he also set his son up quite a bit for the future also. Yeah, generally you can bet, this is kind of from the divorce lawyer side hat I'll wear now, is that when somebody who has recently made a lot of money mm-hmm. during the course of the marriage, in this case, they they get married in 99, that's about the time that his paychecks start rolling in related to Sopranos or soon thereafter. So you have marital assets and income that's substantial coming in. Often the marriage, if it fails thereafter, uh, after at least three years or more, but they're they're at three years, then uh, generally there's a dispute about money mm-hmm. uh, often, and that's because there's money on the tape on the table that perhaps wasn't there before, but it appeared during the course of the marriage. In this case, the fact that there was a settlement, there wasn't uh, litigation in this case, and the settlement agreement, well, I'll mention now, um, it because it ties into the the estate plan, was that one of the things that both parents agreed on was they wanted something set up for his son. Mm -hmm. So his son, of course, was an infant. Um, He agrees to put a $7 million life insurance policy in place that will go into a trust, the proceeds will, and it would be managed on behalf of that child till that child turns age 21. So in this case, um, you have... I, I, I'm pretty confident that Gandolfini was very generous in order for this to have not been tried. I guess yes. that's my point. Yeah. For there not to have been some litigation in this case that might jeopardize his reputation. It could be that his wife's just a wonderful, now ex-wife, is a wonderful person. Yeah. I mean, that that you know, <laughs> I don't want to attribute the fact that there was no conflict just to that, but I think that he was generous in the divorce. Uh, coupled with they, they neither one were wanting more publicity than was necessary. Yeah, and I think that, and this is just me assuming, but I mean, his son was born in May. They got married in 99. His son was born in 99. So I think that they got pregnant before marriage. I couldn't really find anything on that. Um, so it might have just been one of those, like, hey, we need to get married. And then a couple of years down the road, it's one of those, this isn't working out and they both agree and they just need to split. So yeah. they do so amicably and yeah. without a whole bunch of litigation and all of that drama. Yeah. He's probably a good Catholic boy. Probably. Yeah. Yeah. I that imagine. plays into it probably quite a bit. Um, too. So uh, he ends up though marrying again. Yes. And um, let me see. Um, he marries Deborah Lynn and I believe he marries her in 2005. Um, And they go on to, she ends up being his widow, and they go on to have a daughter um, who was nine months old at the time of his death, and her name's Liliana. Mm. So two kids, two marriages. Two marriages. Uh, The second marriage, by all accounts, was going well. Yeah. Yeah. There's no indication that there were any marital problems at the time Mm -hmm. of his death. Um, I guess then... Regarding his death, it in a way it's shocking when somebody fifty one years old yeah. dies. Yeah. And when someone is a star and you feel they have so much ahead of them as well, that too. Uh, but when you look at him, I always before his death, I thought, this guy doesn't look healthy. Yeah, yeah. As he got older, I thought the same. And especially towards have you ever watched The Sopranos? So yeah, especially. I didn't watch it regularly, but I did watch a number of episodes. Towards the end, he's just he doesn't look the greatest. He just looks like life is really happening to him, and he's not like that healthy. Not mm-hmm. in just a you know like a way of like, oh, you can just tell that person doesn't take care of themselves. But like he just looked a little bit like more sickly. Well, you know, in a way, it, you you kind of think that he might have been like the character Tony Soprano yeah. in that in that way. You know, I don't. Uh, I would be surprised to see Tony Soprano in a gym. Was there ever a, ca- a scene where he was in a gym? I don't think so. Okay. Anyway, so you think, think so of this character, and you think <laughs> among the priorities will not be, you know, buff, you know, physique no. and and uh, aerobics. Mm-mm. Another thing that surprised me as I was looking over the material, mainly your research mm-hmm. for this show, is 
the amount of the number of awards he got yeah. during the course of his lifetime it was amazing yeah six emmy awards for just the sopranos and they had six seasons so that's that's an award each season i mean it goes to show you what a fine actor he was and there were these additional awards do you have them in front yeah, of you yeah he uh, won three or, excuse me he won um three emmys for the outstanding leading actor in a drama series but then he also received golden globes american film institute um screen actors guild Television Critics Association, and even more. Yes, yeah, so as well as many others. And yeah, <laughs> and I mean, he was just he was well recognized as an actor by his peers. Mm-hmm. So um, I don't think many people realize that he was highly regarded as a very fine dramatic actor. Yeah, and I mean, for a TV show to have that many to garner Emmys, that sort of respect, yeah, especially yeah. off of the very first season, is crazy. It, it, it kind of ties into, in fact, to his death as well, is that uh, he was actually in Italy with his family mm-hmm. in 2013, and he was to receive another award. And as you said, there's lots of various awards that are important, but they're not widely known and they're not widely reported. Again, uh, there's a couple websites. If you look up his name and then awards, you can find them mm-hmm. uh, in, in uh, his what do you call that history? Not discography. His film, film, isn't it filmography? Maybe filmography. Yeah. Okay, it's film. My, uh, my omniscient uh, uh, producer is telling me that it is filmography. So it's a it's a very impressive list. But anyway, so he is vacationing in Italy with his family. Mm-hmm. He expects to receive a, an award that evening or the next evening yeah i believe it was the next evening okay describe what happened yeah and he just passes away from a sudden heart attack um he's only you know 51 which i mean that's young like in the scheme of all things 51 is very young to be having heart attacks and passing away from them because a lot of the time especially in 2013 modern medicine i mean that heart attack could have been fatal but it probably shouldn't have been Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. And I'm just saying that just because, I mean, with everything that we've come to find out, I, and like you were talking about, I feel like his family had a history of it, too. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was a massive heart attack. Yeah. And, um, and I think that he actually died at the hospital, right? Yeah. And that's why I'm saying I, I feel like it just shouldn't have been fatal with like modern medicine and everything like that and being only 51. Well, certainly, um, I would say this. I would say that he could have done things, I'm sure, to reduce the probability of yeah. that. And that ties in with our discussion a few moments ago is I, I don't think that was important to him, apparently. Um, but. Uh, We were trying to find out what the causes of death of his grandfather and father were. Uh, It could be that, that, you know, this train could have been seen coming and that uh, maybe there just wasn't attention given to it. We don't know the details of that. But clearly, without knowing any of that, he would have been a candidate for a heart attack. Yeah. But, but yeah, could could this have been avoided? It's hard to say. But... um, his son found him, didn't he? Yeah, his son found him, and he was the one who stayed with him until nine one one got there. And yeah, well, son it was wouldn't 14. be nine one one in Italy, but yeah, he would have been. Yep, fourteen. So he found him in the bathroom floor mm-hmm. uh, of the place they're staying in on the beach. Ah, mm-hmm. uh, man, that's not going to leave his son's memory ever. No, and I think his son has done a lot or is doing a lot to honor his memory um, because he played Tony Soprano in, um, I cannot remember the name of that movie, but it came out in 2021. And kind of a comical. Yeah, it's about the Sopranos. Um, So I think, I mean, that's got to be really hard to live with. Yeah. It's just got to be so difficult. Yeah. So, uh, all right. So we've kind of set the stage. There's a surviving wife, two children. Um, and one is like six months old, nine, nine mm-hmm. months old. And then the son is 14. Mm-hmm. Uh, he has two sisters surviving. Yes. And this is relevant because we're going to, we want to shift to the estate plan. Let's first talk about the things that James did correctly. James Gandolfini. One is that he had a will. Uh, 
-hmm. And, you know, uh, coincidental as it seems, the will was prepared about six months before his death. Um, And the will had a distribution plan that there's a little unusual, but it makes more sense when you flesh out some of the details. So the will, which again, wills are public, so we all know what the will says. Any of us, if you type in the search term Gandolfini will, I think you'll pull it up. So it's something that's available as wills are, uh, in our opinion, one of the disadvantages of going through probate. So he had a will, and he his will provides that, in large part, these are the key elements. He, he gave away uh, personal property, all of his property, personal items, his clothing, jewelry, et cetera, to his son, 14-year-old son. Um, he gave $1.5 million approximately uh, to to uh, friends, essentially, uh, people that he had known and were important to him. So there were five or four or five of those people. Um, then then he had a, a house that was going to be available for his son to have the first option to purchase on if he chose. And I think that's the property that's in Manhattan. Yes. Um, and then the residue, and, and that's what's interesting in a will, is sometimes it's it's important to go directly to the the residual clause, as what it's called. And, th- and that's the toward the end of the document where it says, and everything else among my earthly goods, tangible, intangible, Etc. What shall be go shall go to blank, and that's often where the most interesting information is because normally the specific bequests are in the first part of the will, and and everything else usually, which is the bulk of the assets in most cases, will be in the residual clause. So in the residual clause, there was a distribution of thirty percent to one sister, thirty percent to the other sister. Mm-hmm. 20% to his wife and 20% to his daughter, his infant daughter, uh, which would be held in trust until she's an adult. Uh, let me explain this a little bit. I think the reason that there was no mention of the son in this was that the son had already had, as we mentioned earlier, there was a provision in the divorce that there was life insurance and $7 million that was set up to go to him. And so that would be paid into this life insurance trust, will be held until he's age 21, then it would be paid out. So there'll be interest that will accumulate on that. So it could end up being a a substantial amount of money. And another important point here is that was tax-free. Whenever you have money that's that's paid through life insurance and it doesn't go directly into the estate, then it's going to be tax-free. So uh, he was taken care of. Plus, an important thing to know here. Uh, when you look at at this distribution plan, is we don't know everything. And the reason we don't know everything is because, remember, the will is only going to tell you the stuff that's coming through probate. Mm-hmm. It doesn't tell you about what's called non-probate transfers, and which technically would not include a trust under the state statute, but you could regard a trust as being similar to that. And that that is that... Ownership changes the instant you pass away. There's no probate involved, um, no taxes. Oh, well, there could be taxes owed on that. We'll come to that in a minute. Uh, so th- this is money that will avoid all those costs associated with probate, and it also isn't public. So this is kept private. But let's talk a little bit about the tax side. Um, the value of his estate was estimated to be around $70 million. Yeah. Could good chunk of money. It's a really big chunk yeah, of money. <laughs> yeah. And um and yet when we look at the probate documents it shows that uh the estimate value, estimated value is 1 to 10 million dollars. That's a wide range, I realize, but but it must be the nature of the assets um in which they they didn't have a final evaluation whenever we saw these numbers reported. So anyway, 1 to 10 million bucks. So you're thinking where is the rest of it? Well, we know there's more of it for another reason. Um, it turns out these, again, are reports. I uh, haven't seen a government document showing this, but apparently there was in excess of $30 million paid in taxes, which would be from two sources, federal estate taxes, which a tax rate would be around 40% after exemption, uh, 
And then you have a, a New York state tax. So you put those together, and really you're north of like 55%. So, uh, or in the ballpark of 55%, which is shocking. Um, and you think, well, why would somebody pay that if they didn't have to? Well, we know, I'm pretty confident this $30 million number is correct. I've, heard, mm -hmm. I've seen it cited by a number of other lawyers in the area. So the lawyers asked themselves, and this became a very controversial subject. In fact, New York Times had this, dialogue, this sort of debate that occurred over a week plus in the newspaper about, in, in the Times, about what is the explanation for this? And, and was this bad lawyering? So initially, everybody was, said that this is a disaster plan. Experts were speaking out, uh, other state planning lawyers who didn't take a lot of time to examine it, perhaps, and immediately looked at essentially the facts that I've just given you, and said, there's no reason for this. I mean, this clearly could have been avoided. This is a failure on the part of his lawyer to make this clear to him. So there's a lot of blame heaped upon his lawyer, mm -hmm. whose name I'll leave unmentioned. But, uh, but his lawyer defended himself uh, in the New York Times in some follow-up articles all of which were consumed by some of our sources. One thing that troubles me about the New York Times is unless you subscribe, you can't you read. You can't see anything. You can't read yes. the full articles. They'll let you read a first paragraph or two, and but you can't get further than that. So mm -hmm. I'm not willing to subscribe for a lot of reasons to the New York Times. Uh, but if it appears in the Wall Street Journal, I'll know about it. <laughs> anyway, so they had this debate, and which which we've seen written about at length online from reputable uh, state planning sources. And um, I think that the lawyer's position was, without giving any details, there's attorney-client privilege even when your client dies. Many of you don't know that, but mm -hmm. there's still attorney-client privilege, um, which is good to know. We may say confident stuff, very, very personal things about our lives that we don't want shared when we're gone, even. Um, in, in this case, though, what what I think happened, and this is a bit of a consensus among some quarters of those uh, of us who've looked at it, is that first thing is we know that other things can be going on that we don't know about. That, that again, by, defi by definition, they're not public because they're not probate. So if, it's, if there was a trust created, now, if it were an irrevocable trust, it could have been created to, excuse me, to avoid taxes. And clearly, that's what I think should have been done. That's what many agree was something that, that could have saved him a ton of money in taxes. It's possible he could have even paid no taxes mm -hmm. with proper planning. Um, and it doesn't require anything shady or anything of questionable legality. It's pretty clear that, that if you're willing to take certain steps, you can dramatically reduce your estate tax. Now, this isn't just clever moves. It does mean that you have to make some concessions about your control. So those of you who are cynical about whether the rich pay taxes, you can interpret what I'm saying to mean, well, it's it's just a technicality and anybody's rich and wants to not pay, they can easily not pay. They can't easily not pay, meaning that it would have been easy for him to reduce his taxes, but but in order to dramatically reduce his taxes, he'd have to be willing to make some concessions. Mm -hmm. He'd have to be willing to transfer his assets, for example, in substantial part to an irrevocable trust or to create a family limited partnership in which he keeps a very small percentage ownership, but he transfers most of the ownership to others. Um, that that produces reduced value in his estate. Um, there, are, there are various things that he could have done and he could have minimized his taxes, but he probably would have lost some degree of control, perhaps, over the assets. We'd have to go down each of these alternatives to talk about the pros and cons for each. Uh, but the point is, there are alternatives there, and if somebody is really concerned about, in this case, $30 million, then there, there was an alternative. Now, let's point out, too, though, that 
that there were things probably that was done that we don't know about, and and they just uh, didn't have the opportunity to generate the tax benefit that they would have over time. Mm-hmm. For example, had he created an irrevocable trust and and he put assets in it over time, then he could have given himself notes. He could have made gifts that would have gotten him allowed him to use his exemption. Uh, there are a variety of ways in which he could have over time reduced his estate. And maybe having created some machinery for that at the time he did his estate planning six months before. We just don't know the answer to all these questions. Another factor that I think was at work here is, and particularly given what we've talked about with his personality, I don't think he was real money driven. And I'm not sure that the issue of taxes would have, even the inefficiency, uh, I don't know that that would have alarmed him in the way it does some of us, myself included. (laughs) Um, So what what some have speculated is that, look, this is a client who, as often happens, and this should be talked about more than it is, a client who goes to his attorney, his attorney having his his own goals in mind, which generally involve, you know, let's minimize taxes, let's um, minimize risk of of losing it to third parties let's do some asset protection you know in other words as attorneys there are some go-to things that we immediately assume our clients want to do mm-hmm. usually those assumptions are right usually our clients want to pay as little as few taxes as possible usually asset protection is something that's important to them usually privacy is something that's very important to them so all those things often were right and that's the reason perhaps as lawyers we we go there uh, instinctively when we're thinking about how to help our clients. But it's not always true of clients. And this may be one of them where where Gandolfini may have heard what these alternatives were. And he may have heard that, look, they require you doing things or making concessions that that you didn't feel as comfortable about. And um, one, I'll give you one example. He, they could have transferred the assets through a credit shelter trust uh, to the wife where she would have gotten income for a period of time and at her death, then then the assets would have the benefit of her exemption as well as his. And and the, the assets would be protected during that period of time and ultimately maybe pay zero taxes on them. But that's a longer term goal. That's a goal that would be lived out over time during her life. That's an easy one. And, um, and it's an example of the things where when you do estate planning and you minimize taxes, usually it's not a free trip without some concessions. Usually you make some concessions of control, availability, et cetera, following certain rules, structure that some people don't like, you know, have, creating an irrevocable trust. Maybe if, if, that, if he was told that option and, and he was told that he had to follow certain rules, that he couldn't reach in and grab the money when he wanted, et cetera. He may have not liked that. He may have uh, wanted to give his family members access to money immediately and not not put it in trust where it be paid out over time, which is another thing. I'm, I'm going to give his lawyer the benefit of the doubt and say he probably said, James, you probably don't want to pay this out, this much money to your kids when they're 21, and his daughter and son are both going to get money at 21, mm-hmm. a substantial money. Um, that's usually a mistake. It's an exceptional kid where it's not. Um, I'm, I'm going to assume the lawyer said that. And I think I think that this client is somebody who wanted to provide money to his family. He knew that there's a lot of money, more than their practical needs were. Mm-hmm. He knew that the even after a substantial amount is taken away for taxes, I think that he realized it still is a lot of money for them and they'll be happy and they'll have their money sooner and without complications. Um, I wonder too, just given the timeline of when he set it up, um, his daughter would have only been nine months old. So I wonder if somebody was like, hey, you need to do this. And then he did it and he was like, well, that you know, that's fine for now. I'll revisit it. Because nobody expects to just pass away six months after you set up your will. But um, I wonder if it was just kind of one of those scenarios of just, oh, it's done. Okay, check it off my list. I'll get back to it, to the finer details. Or 
It could have been that. Yeah. Wouldn't you love to be a fly on the wall when he was meeting with his attorney? Because, I mean, it could have been just what you described. I'm sitting here thinking more deeply about it. <laughs> and it may turn out to be that it was what you described, where he just said, look, you know, let's get something in place. Yeah, yeah, I know we can do these things. We'll do them eventually. But mm-hmm. I just want to have something in place mm-hmm. so that if something happens to me, at least I know that that these these four or five items that I want to know uh, are taken care of, are, are taken care of, mm-hmm. which they were, meaning I think that he he left enough money for each of these people, but it but all of us are still troubled by that so much money went to uh, New York State yeah. and to the federal government that was totally unnecessary, and uh, it troubled a lot of people, and uh, and yet it could be for all the reasons we've mentioned as well as maybe some more that his lawyer put it in front of him mm-hmm. and he said no no i'm good <laughs> uh but but before we wrap up this show though i want to um i want uh, i want to make a couple of distinctions um whenever you're you're thinking about trying to avoid having to go through probate and and all the costs associated with that we talked about the lack of publicity uh, or the the desire to avoid publicity that that's important to most people uh, obviously that's a reason in and of itself but but it shouldn't go unmentioned that what we don't know here is the amount of money that went in costs associated with the estate mm-hmm. you in, in most states there's a percentage schedule that you can charge so even if it's a simple case where there's no conflict you get to still collect this big the, this substantial percentage generally doing estates law firms that focus on probate they do very well because your rate of return per hour is typically above what you might otherwise earn um, it, and and all everyone else that's involved makes money, and the, even the court administration makes money. So it's it's a process where we don't know how much was spent here, but given the magnitude of it, put aside the fact that it appeared relatively simple. This is not an ugly case like we t- so often talk yeah. about on this show. This is one of the, those where things went smoothly, harmoniously. Yeah. Isn't it refreshing to have a family where it doesn't appear to be? I know. I know. That's why I picked this one because I was like, we have just put we need our a audience through the ringer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, so, so th- this would, you know, as these things go, appears to be pretty straightforward and simple which makes it all the more frustrating that uh, a significant amount of money went to probate costs. And apart from the attorney as a personal representative, personal representative too gets paid. And uh, anybody who comes into value assets, um, uh, if there's any attorneys that are hired apart from this to, to address any issues in the estate, which there always, almost always are, then that's more money paid out apart from from the person who's doing the estate directly. So uh, it's another thing to think about. So at a minimum, those those of you need to draw from this, look, at least whatever his goals, he could have done this without probate. Mm-hmm. He could have had a living trust created um, in which he puts put his assets in it. Um, it means that nothing goes through probate. Uh, so you have the privacy. You avoid the costs. So those those two items on your list of four or five things that are really important to you, and typically the issues are are taxes. That's often a driving consideration. I want to minimize taxes, costs, and uh, attorney fees and other things which might be separate from taxes and are different criteria. Those typically people want to minimize. They the privacy is generally important to families. The assets the that that they the family is has passed to one another. We don't want creditors knowing what we've inherited in some cases. We definitely don't want third parties knowing what we've inherited and and neighbors and whatnot. I mean, it's a world where information like that can be used against you and, and more so today than ever before. So privacy now is really a big deal. Another issue that people worry about is asset protection. And asset protection is you know, again, there's there's creditors and there's predators and there's soon to be ex wives and ex husbands and and all these things pose risk. But asset protection is a different thing from privacy, but they are related in some ways. Another thing relates to control, and control means 
maybe you have people, your children, you just feel you just can't hand them this money. So control is important. You you want an estate plan that, that allows you to be confident that the money will be there benefiting your children. Typically, it's children. Benefiting your children over the next 30, 40, 50, the balance of their lives and maybe beyond. So those those five criteria uh, generally dominate people's motives when they walk in to see a domestic uh, and when they walk in to see an estate planning lawyer. And and in this case, um, several of those could have been better addressed without a doubt and still met Gandolfini's concern. Mm-hmm. And uh, living trust is a good example. It's fully revocable. There's no loss of of his ability to control it while he's alive. Um, but he could have put in provisions that that would have assured that his children had this money much longer than they do. He could have avoided all the costs. This is not a tax solution, but it's a it's a solution to the costs associated with probate and the delay. So that could have been avoided. Uh, he could he could also have have placed in there assets that that he wanted to have managed over time in a certain way so that the assets survive. It's a different thing than the issue of of whether your your child can be entrusted with this much money this soon. It's the issue of assuring that it's properly managed. And again, that's another advantage of a trust. So trusts are, mm-hmm. are relatively inexpensive, a revocable trust, and it solves those problems. To address the the tax issues, then that that's when you kind of go up a level in sophistication. You know, there's more attorney fees and uh, and there there are concessions. And for a revocable trust, you have to live with the many concessions in terms of your control and the way you conduct your life. Not really, not not anything significant. Whereas if you want to really avoid taxes and have tax solutions, often those, not always, often they'll include an irrevocable trust. And and that is that does require following strict rules. You you generally can't run your assets in exactly the same way as you did before. Um, and for it to be fully beneficial, often you can't go back and undo entirely what you did before. Now, mm-hmm. there are some exceptions to that, but still. So, but in this case, done properly, probably would have been $30 million. Why do I think his, his attorney fees might have been? Not, not a, far, far <laughs> less than a million. So maybe he would have spent, let's assume, $50,000 in attorney fees, which probably would have been more like 30000 Yeah. Think about that. Thirty thousand dollars in attorney, and I'm willing to bet that he could have done it for that price. Yeah, thirty thousand dollars for attorney fees would have saved him thirty million. Now, again, I don't know all the details, give or take a little bit of that, but you get my point. It, I mean, clearly, it would have saved him a substantial part of that, uh, and possibly all of it. Say it saved him twenty million. I know. Yeah, it's a shame. It's a shame. But, I know. but you know, Gandolfini, I don't think we'll come back and wrap up with this. I just don't think he was driven that much by his wealth. No, I don't think he was either. I think, like we were talking about, it was just something to just check off the list for him. But even, even then, it's just kind of wild that they didn't consider, you know, his like his name, um, any like royalties he would get after his death or anything like that, because the Sopranos are still huge. It's 2023, and everybody still knows the Sopranos. Yeah, you you know you raise a good point. Um, yeah, I wonder what his contract, what rights he has for yeah. continuing revenues. Yeah, and I I mean also to the point of creating a trust. He didn't know his daughter. I mean, of course she's she's a baby. She's not any kind of kid. He doesn't know what kind of child she is he doesn't know you know how she might be when she grows up so who knows how she'll spend that money when she turns 21 yeah very interesting so i guess what the family will do is what we've seen time and time again in cases with celebrities is if there's residual Mm -hmm. intellectual property revenue royalties then uh, generally that they'll form a trust or some entity that will manage it on behalf of the family, but the entity would be owned by the heirs. And so these people who got the residuary, those listed in the residuary clause of the will, anything that comes in in the future of value to him or his estate 
would be owned by by these four in that proportion. Yeah, and I think, like you said, he wasn't money driven, but I think it's a testament to if you love your family, make sure that you're setting them up for success because they're going to have to go through a lot to be able to set all of that up and yeah, everything. Yeah. And, and one other thing um, that I failed to mention is there was direct reference in the will to the fact that his wife and daughter, the youngest. Yes. Yeah, his wife and daughter were, it, a sentence specifically states that they were taken care of outside of the will. And because there was no objection mm. by his wife and daughter, then I'm sure it was, again, one of those assets we don't know about, mm-hmm. but the IRS knew about, yeah. <laughs> um, that that wasn't mentioned in the will. So, um, so th- those of you who are thinking... Didn't he shortchange his wife and daughter for these two for his sisters? And no, there there were provisions for them, and the wife must have been very satisfied. Mm-hmm. So yeah, all right. Uh, <laughs> this is a I, yeah. I was glad to see that you had suggested we do Gandolfini. Yeah, I'm a fan of his. Yeah, I love The Sopranos. I haven't, you know, I've watched some of his other movies, but I love The Sopranos. So, <laughs> all right. Well, this has been another episode of Life's Third Act. I hope you enjoyed it as well as learned something. Till next time, take care. You've been listening to Life's Third Act, a podcast for thriving in retirement, sponsored by Tucker Allen, your estate and elder law advisors. Each week, we discuss topics and answer questions to help you better plan for your future. For more information, visit tuckerallen.com. Subscribe and listen again next week for another edition of Life's Third Act. The choice of a lawyer is an important decision and should not be based solely on advertisements.